Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space Updates. I'm Jean Deville, joined as always by Blaine Curcio. In this episode, we deep dive into the many recent announcements coming from Chinese new space launch startups, which suggest that 2022 is going to be a pretty crazy year. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. The past couple of weeks were unprecedented for Chinese new space. There were all of the updates that were linked to small set manufacturing, which we covered in last week's episode. And this week, it seems like it's the turn of Chinese new space launch startups. The star of the show was Galactic Energy, a launch company who raised 1.27 billion RMB or roughly 200 million US dollars in a new BB plus round of funding. Now, let's put 200 million US dollars into some perspective here. 200 million US dollars, that is the second largest round of funding in the history of Chinese new space after the round of CGSTL in 2020. And it is the largest round ever in China for a commercial launch startup. I think slightly exceeding the 170 to 180 ish million US dollars that were raised respectively by iSpace and Landspace last year. Now, to put this round of funding into a little perspective here, the focus of the Chinese commercial launch sector right now is really it's a race to launch a liquid fueled reusable medium lift rocket, which should be the type of rocket to capture most of China's constellation deployment launches in the future. And there are many contenders, I believe at least 20 ish launch companies all aiming at this objective with maybe a couple, only a handful that are close to the finish line. And you have the usual suspects, land space, ice space, galactic energy, and maybe a handful of others like deep blue aerospace or maybe space pioneer. Now, as Galactic Energy is the star of the show this week, let's really quickly recap what they are trying to do. So Galactic Energy has a solid field small lift rocket called the Series 1, which was launched twice in the past, and they plan to ramp up the launch cadence to five times in the coming 12 months. The liquid field rocket by Galactic Energy is called the Palace 1. It's a Carolox field rocket, and it puts five tons into orbit and also it is reusable. They also have a heavier version called the Palace 1A, which adopts a sort of a Falcon heavy architecture and which puts 14 tons into low Earth orbit. The maiden launch of the Palace 1 is expected in 2023. Now, the fellow competing launch companies of Galactic Energy, namely iSpace and Landspace, are preparing rockets with similar value propositions. You have notably the ZQ-2, 2A, and 2B coming from Landspace that puts respectively 6, 17, and 32 tons into LEO. And you have iSpace with their Hyperbola 2, 3, 3A, and 3B, which put 2, 9, 13, and 32 tons into low Earth orbit. These, of course, are figures when considering the rocket as an expendable rocket. Obviously, when it's reusable, the amount of payload goes down. Now, another good question is what is Galactic Energy planning to do with all of this money that they've just raised? Naturally, this money will go to fund the research and development of their Palace One reusable liquid fueled medium lift rocket. But it's also interesting to note that the press release put emphasis on developing the launch infrastructure for this rocket, which is naturally, you know, launch infrastructure is the cornerstone for any um, launch service provider. And in this regard, I think it's really been fascinating to watch the different approaches taken by different commercial launch companies in China. Just to give a few examples. So Galactic Energy, they seem to be going the sea launch route. And it was known that they wanted to enable their solid field series one rocket to launch from land, but also from sea-based platforms. But with this week's announcement, it seems that this could also be the case for their Palace One liquid fuel rocket. I'm saying this because notably there was a mysterious render of a sea platform included in the press release. Now, of course, this remains a lot of speculation for just one render, but it would fit nicely with the fact that China's main sea-based launch site in Haiyang in Shandong province mentioned that they are developing their launch activity, their launch site to enable sea-based liquid fuel launches. So that does seem to fit quite nicely. 
Now, um, Galactic Energy's competitors, Landspace, on the other hand, is planning a more traditional route. They are uh, building a launch site in Jotran, and this is to enable the launch of their methlox fueled ZQ-2 rocket. And many Earth observation satellites over the past couple of weeks and months have been taking snapshots of the construction at Jotran making progress. And finally, the last competitor, iSpace, is also going this more traditional route following the footsteps of land space. They seem to have increasing ties with the Wenchang Launch Center in the southern province of Hainan, which very likely means that they plan to launch their Hyperbola 2 rocket from that launch site. So while Galactic Energy definitely stole the spotlight over the past week with their massive route of funding, there was also a couple of other rounds that are worth mentioning in this episode. We have Deep Blue Aerospace, notably, which is another launch company. We can roughly consider them maybe as number four or number five in commercial launch in China. They raised nearly 200 million RMB or roughly 30 million US dollars in an A round of funding. And that was on January the 18th. And this money will go to fund the Nebula One liquid field rocket. We also had Orion Space, a more recent commercial launch company that raised 300 million RMB or roughly 40, I think, or 45 million US dollars on January the 26th. And this new inflow of cash will be used to develop their Gravity One rocket as well as their heavier thrust liquid-filled engines for Orion Space's future rockets. And final point on Orion Space, while this is not directly linked to rounds of funding, they signed a strategic cooperation agreement with an engine manufacturer called Aerospace Propulsion, meaning that Orion Space could, you know, could likely source their engines from this engine manufacturer. And this would make a lot of sense because Orion Space is a latecomer to commercial launch in China. They were founded in June 2020 only. And so it makes sense as a latecomer to try and make up for that uh, by buying off-the-shelf engines if those are available. So um, we still have to wait to see if that is actually going to be the case, but this agreement seems to suggest this path. And finally, this strategy also uh, resembles a little bit another latecomer rocket pie who in June 2020 also signed a similar agreement with another engine manufacturer, this time Jojo and Jen, to purchase their methlox fueled rocket engines. So a lot of things going on this week in the Chinese commercial launch sector. There are actually a couple of updates that we did not mention here because it would make the video too long. So do check out our newsletter at newsletter.dongfonghour.com to know more. And, you know, without any further ado, Blaine, what are your thoughts on this absolutely crazy week in commercial launch? Yeah, some crazy shit. Um, and just a short reminder before getting into my part here, um, if you're interested in more insights on Galactic Energy and Land Space, two of the leading companies that Jean just discussed, we do have a couple of uh, deep dive interviews with those two companies back in the archive. So do take a look. Um, so now just a couple of points to put this funding into context. So um, as John mentioned, this has been a crazy year so far for Chinese launch funding. And, and really it's been a crazy seven or eight years for, for Chinese commercial launch funding. And I have a database that maintains all of the different funding rounds. And if we look at you know the last eight years or so since 2014, total Chinese commercial launch funding is between like 13 and 16 billion RMB. So like between two and 2.5 billion US dollars. And obviously, this is a huge amount of money. It, it's the second largest commercial launch ecosystem in the world in terms of, of funding. Um, but if we compare it to the leading primarily U.S., uh, but say Western launch companies, it's still a, a, a relatively it's not a huge amount. So um, the couple of numbers that would stand out would be that in 2021 alone, SpaceX raised about one point five billion U.S. dollars. Um, and then also when we look at the two, I think, biggest launch company SPACs that we saw over the last year or so, so Rocket Lab and um and Astra, uh, these two companies raised about 777 million US dollars and about 500 million US dollars, respectively. And so if we total up those three, I mean, that exceeds already just about the total funding for Chinese commercial launch companies ever over the last eight years. So again, about two, 2.5 billion. And so this is not to take away from the incredible couple of months and indeed, you know, handful of years that it's been, but really to say that if we expect to see a Chinese launch industry at the sort of level of, of the U.S. or of the you know, leading Western companies, um, we should probably expect to see more money. This is probably not the, the plateau necessarily, but we may continue to see bigger funding rounds. So there's a lot going on with orbital launch companies, but there is also an increasing amount going on with companies that are doing suborbital launch. And these launch vehicles are being developed uh, in order to you know conduct technology verification tests for industries such as space or military or material sciences. Uh, or otherwise just academic research. And so up to this point, there are at least three companies that are known to be developing suborbital launch vehicles. So notably, OneSpace, Space Trek, and Space Transportation. 
And so of these three companies, you can really divide them into two buckets. So you have one space and space track that have a fairly similar profile, which is to say they are both developing solid fueled single stage suborbital rockets. So notably the OSX for one space and the Tansua one for space track. And both are also at the same time developing orbital rockets. So notably the Linglong liquid fueled rocket for one space and the Sing Tu one solid fuel rocket and two unnamed liquid fuel rockets uh, for space track. And then the other sort of bucket of different suborbital launch companies would be space transportation. And space transportation is going down a different road, namely the fact that they are developing the Tianxing 1 and 2 series of just purely suborbital rockets, which are solid fueled. They have flown several times and uh, most recently being this past week. And they're likely going to serve similar markets to the suborbital launch vehicles being developed by Space Trek and by One Space, albeit with some differences. So notably the Tianxing 1 and Tianxing 2, uh, they seem to make more use of aerodynamic lift with delta wings clearly visible on the rocket. And more notably, I think it seems like space transportation is just a more successful company, both at selling its launch services up to this point, but also at just doing it, its its launches and just in, in a lot of the things they do. And I think from this perspective, space transportation really is, is one of these companies to watch. So just to give a couple of examples of what they've been up to, um, their most recent launch of the Tianxing 1 and 2, this was the 10th launch that they have conducted of the Tianxing series uh, suborbital launch vehicle. And up to this point, they've also found some very kind of blue chip interesting customers. So a couple of notable ones would include the Combustion and Propulsion Laboratory of Tsinghua University, which seems to have tested a scramjet prototype on a two-stage Tianxing a couple of days ago. Um, and then the other notable customer was uh, Xiamen University that tested a Wave Rider type hypersonic payload design on a launch in 2019. And just one last point, I think, that makes space transportation kind of the odd man out in this Chinese uh, commercial launch ecosystem. So rather than pursuing orbital launch with a liquid fueled VTVL rocket, they prefer to go kind of more of a space plane route uh, and target markets such as suborbital space tourism, as well as point to point intercontinental earth transportation. And recently space transportation published a three stage roadmap, uh, which puts dates on their plans. So 2019 to 2023 being dedicated to suborbital rockets for primarily test flights. So similar to the two university tests that I mentioned earlier. Uh, then 2023 to 2025 being a suborbital space tourism space plane uh, period with a prototype being launched in 2023 and with a first human carrying launch in 2025. And so again, that's just about uh, what less than four-ish years away. And then 2025 to 2030, uh, we have hypersonic space plane, which will enable intercontinental travel. And from renders shown by the company, uh, the space plane should be a two-stage rocket launching vertically um, with a lift generating second stage. And despite the space plane shape of the second stage, uh, which is going to be carrying the passengers, uh, it would actually perform a vertical landing. And so definitely a pretty interesting and, and definitely unique uh, launch vehicle um, among the, uh, the Chinese commercial launch companies. And a first flight for this vehicle is being planned for 2028 with an entry into service in 2030. So uh, a fascinating project for sure if they can pull it off. And, and I do think up to this point, uh, space transportation has more or less pulled off what they've said they're going to do. So a company to watch. And digressing and taking it all the way back to suborbital launch, it definitely seems like there's an increasing niche in China for these kind of vehicles and these kind of services. And while up to this point, we've seen space transportation really capture the lion's share of the market with 10 launches for its Tianxing compared to three and one for one space and space track uh, respectively, uh, we did see space track raise a few tens of millions of RMB of funding in around just earlier this week. So they certainly should not be written off just yet. And, you know, one space, I mean, they, they've been around for quite a long time. They're a survivor, if, if nothing else. Um, so again, space transportation probably in the lead, but a couple of other contenders here. And I'd like to note that um, Space Trek, it's, it's interesting, you know, th their round of funding last week, uh, they had mentioned that it's going to go towards their liquid fueled rocket engines, as well as their Changfeng series of cruise missiles. And I think this brings us to our fun fact of the day and also to the conclusion of this episode. Um, just the fact that Space Trek seems to be very open with the fact that they are developing these Changfeng cruise missiles that are very you know, military use product, uh, products. And then also they're kind of more commercial uh, suborbital launch vehicles. So rather than, or, you know, rather unlike uh, some of the other companies in the Chinese commercial space sector, which may be doing military civil fusion related activities and just doing it in a rather covert way, um, it's interesting to see that Space Trek is very open about the fact that they are developing the Changfeng series of uh, missiles in general. So um, on that happy note, uh, Jean, anything else from uh, from your side this week? So nothing more on my side on the different launch updates that we uh, mentioned that we described earlier. I just want to add that, again, there are updates that we did not mention in this episode linked to Linkspace, to Space Time, to other rocket companies. 
So do check out our newsletter if you're interested in that. It's really been a pretty crazy week. For sure. And just a couple of last points to round out the episode. A quick shout out to our good friends at GoTikonauts and SpaceWatch.Global. And a special thanks to Xiang, Xiangnan Li, uh, who bought us some coffees this mm. week over at buymeacoffee.com slash Hour. So thank you very much uh, to Xiangnan Li. And if you've liked this episode, do feel free to go buy us some coffees over at the aforementioned buymeacoffee.com slash Hour. Also, to Sean's earlier point, there are a number of additional news updates this week. It has been a crazy month of January, let me tell you. And um, I think that's about all for this week. And also just want to add happy Chinese New Year if you have any Chinese listeners. And uh, we'll see you next week's episode. For sure. May the year of the tiger bring much uh, prosperity and, uh, you know, open borders, hopefully. But that's maybe being a bit too optimistic. We'll see. Thank you very much for watching and uh, see you next week. Bye.